Last week, I uh, was speaking about how to be great, and uh, uh, we got um, a little ways down the road with it, and uh, we understood a few things, and I want to uh, maybe bring some of those things up. We had come from uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, <clears throat> where it says, uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians uh, 2 and uh, Verse 5, uh, it says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, which actually means a slave, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Uh, so <clears throat> we see Christ's life um, is uh, literally Jesus being the prototype. He is our example. The word Christian means Christ-like. So if we are uh, to walk and live um, as a Christian or Christ-like, we're going to have to look at Christ. Isn't that right? How did he live his life? What did uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, uh, he wrote uh, a third of the New Testament. And uh, um, so, so we, we listen to Paul uh, because we want to actually literally read the Bible uh, with the flashlight of the epistles. Uh, because um, uh, the Gospels um, are Christ's life, uh, but still it's actually functioning under the Old Covenant, if you will. And uh, so, so we see Christ's life, which is good, and we can look there to see how he lived and, and pattern ourselves after that. But the Apostle Paul had this great revelation of what his death, burial, and resurrection meant and what that means to us. And so he gave us a, a, a more of an explosion of of the picture of who we really are in him. Praise God. And, uh, of course, uh, here at Word of Life, Pastor David has, has spent much time over these years teaching on who we are in Christ, which is major, major, major. Praise God. Amen? And uh, so, so we look at Christ, um, whom we are inside, and actually him being in us and us in him is the very power for us to do what he did. And he said, the things that I have done, you shall do, and greater things. So uh, apparently, um, you know, against a popular religious belief, um, most religious beliefs, even in Christianity, a lot of times is that, well, you know, uh, I I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by grace, but I'm a sinner. Well, listen, uh, if, if we're going to live our life like Christ did, I don't think he walked around saying, I'm just a sinner. In fact, he was without sin. Isn't that right? Okay, and so, so if, if, if he says, if the word says things like, be holy as I am holy, that must mean it's possible. And understand, I, have, I feel like I have to repeat this quite often, is that man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Okay, so, so uh, spiritually speaking, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we became perfect. Did you know that? You have the same life on the inside of you that God has on the inside of him. He's perfect. You're perfect. You are not trying to be righteous. You are righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, so we don't dismiss that and say, yeah, but I'm still going to live in sin. No, that is not what we say, and that's not what we're supposed to do. Does it happen? Sure, it may happen. But listen, you can go three months without sinning. If you can go three months, you can go a year. Uh, it, it is possible or else it wouldn't be said. Do you understand? And people will, will resort back to their, uh, what they call, well, I'm only human. No, you're not only human. You are an offspring of the Most High God. God is your Father. The creator of the universe moved himself on the inside of you. And you're going to walk around and diminish this position seated at the right hand of the Father to say, I'm only something other than that? You are a superhuman, not just only human. If you are only human, then Jesus was only human. You cannot say that of the Son of God, and you cannot say that of yourself. 
You are in him. Woo! The fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form, and I am complete in him. I like watching those superhero movies because I like to imagine myself as, as just being powerful. And you look at some of the most powerful, you know, Marvel, DC groups, you know, and, and say, who's your favorite hero? You know, I love to say that to the youth, you know. And, and, uh, and actually, I, I did a, a, a lesson to the youth, and I picked out all the different um, uh, superheroes that were like some of, some of the aspects of which God says that we are now. Praise the Lord. I mean, listen, we've had people that have walked on water. We have people that have parted water. We have had people that have stopped the sun. Interesting stuff. The sun and the moon for a day. Ah, so they could win the war. Eh, it was inconvenient to get dark. So, Think about the super powers that reside on the inside of you. And we like to put those off on, yeah, you know, we remember Catherine Kuhlman. We remember, you know, Amy Simple McPherson. We remember Smith Wigglesworth, uh, you know, Raise the Dead. I think there was 20-some people. Some say 100, but I think it was more like 20-some people. But listen, if he, he raised one person, that's one more than I have. But Jesus commanded us to do these things. He did those things. He commanded us to do these things. So, so you can't just say I'm only human. So whatever God's word says that we are to be or to do, that means we can do it. It's not just some kind of pipe dream. It's not just some kind of, you know, oh, it's kind of a metaphor for doing it. No, it's really, honestly, you can do this. You can live your life like the word says to live it. And, and the devil and this world and religion would try and push you into some kind of mold and, and give you an out, give you some kind of clause that says you don't have to or you can't. When God is literally expecting us to step up to the plate and set our feet and get ready to swing. Because you are a home run hitter. You are not just the water boy. You are in the game. A key player. A player, not player. <laughs> if you a player, you miss the whole thing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So he, he said, he's saying, Paul, he's saying, let this mind be in you. It's, it, you must allow, he said, let, that means you must allow uh, yourself to think as though Christ would think of himself, measure yourself as Christ would measure himself. And what he said is, even though he was God, he didn't uh, grab hold and say, I am he, uh, even though one time it made people fall on their backside. Most of the time he told them, don't tell anybody who I am. Don't tell what happened to you. Miracles, signs, and wonders. He wasn't here to wave his own banner. He was here to serve the will of the Father. He came as a servant. And it seems if you want to be great as we have spoken of, then you will have to grab hold of the fact that you are a servant of the Most High God and discover how it is that he would have you to serve. Because you have specific service, a specific supply that you have inside of you that I don't have in me. I have to have you give your supply. If I'm going to get what I need and be what I'm supposed to be, I must have you to give your supply. Because we are a body fitly joined together. Each joint, each person supplying and when we don't get to the place to give our supply, the body suffers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
It's interesting how every aspect and detail of our bodies are significant. And, and even like the hairs in your nose. Yeah, you know, I don't want to necessarily imagine myself as a nose hair. But I tell you what, it's a part of your body. Keeps dust out of your lungs. Yeah, do you change the filter on your house air conditioner? Well, you should if you have it. You should probably check it. It's been running all summer. But man, I tell you what, we're, we're grateful and thankful for each and every part. Amen. Hallelujah. We saw in Romans where Paul said, I, Paul, a servant, serving as an apostle. So he recognized and acknowledged himself as a servant first. Praise the Lord. We know Jesus served the disciples and washed their feet and said, do the same. We saw that. We see, see how specifically we ended with uh, say, saying how each and every one of you have uh, gifts and talents and even abilities uh, from, from being doctors, lawyers, uh, you, you name it. In this room, teachers, we have all kinds of gifts and hairdressers and plumbers and AC people. And, and uh, we have a, a former fireman and, and uh, uh, police officers. And, oh, we are grateful for all these gifts and talents. But I want you to understand that all of those abilities and skills and talents, sometimes we as Christians will think, well, I, I do that just to make money, but then, then I, I, after that I serve God. No, no, it's all serving God. It's all serving God. And God himself, you know, it, it, this whole thing began with what God was doing. It was called work. That on the seventh day he rested from his what? His work. And I tell you what, woo, man, God really can work. This whole world and cosmos and woo, the beautiful things. Oh, my goodness. And this morning, the sunrise. And oh, thank God for that little bit of rain to get that dust out of the air. Woo, glory to Jesus. But we just thank God. He's just amazing. Rivers and streams and, and oceans and, and fish and animals and birds. And, and man, the, the most peculiar creature here is us. All the diversity, all the creativity of God himself, and you are one of those. Isn't that something? What a joy, what a pleasure to be able to serve such a mighty and amazing God. Hallelujah to Jesus. So God worked, and when he finished his work, he rested. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, he, he put us in the garden to tend it. Isn't that right? And so we are here now to continue that work and serve the purpose and the will of God. And uh, um, Adam uh, would probably have been known as a farmer, isn't that right? And, uh, and a security agent, of which he failed miserably. His security team broke down. Satan came into the garden. The whole, you know, he says, there is something out here that needs to be dominated he said, you need to uh, watch over this little area here. He didn't. He just was like in, looking at the naked woman. So Abraham was a chieftain into agriculture and cattle, a modern-day trading company CEO, had 1,000 employees. This is Abraham. I'm talking about the work part. Our gifts and talents serving the purpose of God has its manifestation in natural things. So please don't think that because you do something natural, that it is less than what I do because I'm a pastor. We need you to cut somebody's hair. It's a shorter job for me. <laughs> but we need you. We actually, you know, um, I believe God and his healing power. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that there are people that have studied the human body and you can walk into them and say, hey, I have this going on and them tell you a little bit about that. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And nowadays they can get an x-ray and see what's going on on the inside there and stuff like that and go, oh, look at that. And I'm like, ah, thank you. I know what to believe for now. Praise the Lord. I'll see you later. Yeah. Glory to God. And so we are grateful and thankful for everybody's gifts and talents. Yeah. Amen? And uh, Daniel and Joseph both worked in government. Praise God. We need to pray for them, obviously. God help America. Luke was the New Testament doctor, if you didn't know. Um, 
Lydia was a prominent businesswoman who played a prominent role in the church at Philippi. Uh, Paul was a tent maker and leather worker. Uh, so my point being is, is we can't remove our uh, occupations from God's gifting. Do you understand? Uh, literally, God has his hand on you uh, to do uh, whatever it is that you're doing. And obviously, when you, uh, you know, in, in high school, you know, I did some things uh, that I really, uh, you know, am glad I'm not doing those things right now. I, I packed chickens uh, for the, one of the earlier jobs I had. I mean, it, it started at like 10 p.m. You know, it started when it was dark because that's when the chickens, uh, you know, lay down. And uh, so there was different jobs, but not any of the jobs uh, left you without smelling like, woo, <laughs> poopery. <laughs> Anyways, so, so <laughs> and you could not wash that stuff out of your hands, you know. Uh, but I really believe that uh, there are things that prepare you for the end game, if you will. And, and so working like that, working in the uh, uh, fire trails, uh, uh, cutting fire trails with a chainsaw and, and uh, just all these different things that develop inside of you the preparation for what's coming. Uh, Jesus himself, did you know that Jesus worked in the wood shop from the time he was 12 years old until he started his ministry at 30 years old? That's a long time, huh? But what was he doing preparing? It's interesting that he was a carpenter, and Jesus is building his church. Lest the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. I think it's interesting that his occupation really tied into who he is. Isn't that interesting? And of course, he turned the known world upside down in three years and has changed humanity for eternity. Literally, what Jesus did changed everything. And so, so what I'm saying is we have um, at work in us right now, uh, we are not on hold, we are in it, we are um, active, and how we are to move in function is serve. Serve uh, when you're grabbing hold of a chicken leg. Serve if you're grabbing hold of that chicken's leg as unto the Lord. Literally, one leg, each chicken, three chickens in each hand, out to the door you go. Hand it to the guy who puts them in a crate in the truck. He grabs them from you, <laughs> feathers fly up in the air. He slams the door down, opens the other side. <laughs> that was a real job. But the Bible says we're to do everything, everything as unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And a lot of times when you work on a live on a farm in the country, uh, you do a lot of work that you don't get a dime for. You live on a farm. How do you spell farm? W-O-R-K. And so, so we're, we're shoveling all kinds of stuff uh, because what, what those th creatures produce is a blessing to the garden. And you can tell uh, when it's March or so, uh, the whole entire county smells like fertilizer. And we're throwing that stuff on there, rototilling it in. It makes for beautiful tomatoes and beans and corn. And woo -wee. My, my friend said, this is miracle grow. <laughs> I said, I don't know what kind of miracle's going on here, but it's burning my eyes. <laughs> Let's look in our Bibles, if you would, to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and, and verse 17. This is the amplified version. It says, but Jesus answered them, my father has worked even until now. He has never ceased working. He is still working, and I too must be at divine work. Woo! There you have it. Father works, I work. Guess what we are to do? We are to do the work. 
in uh, uh, the New Living, it says, but Jesus replied, my father is always working, and so am I. Everybody say, and so am I. And so we are a people uh, that are a working people, a serving people. Glory to God. God has called no one, as long as you have breath, you are to work. There is no retirement from this work. You may retire from your occupation, which is a blessing that gives you more time for the work of God. Hallelujah. So we don't retire, we refire. Amen. It's like we repurpose our time. Take our time and do something amazing for other people. I love that. There's, there's a, the, a gentleman at the gym. He's, he's a Jewish gentleman, but he, he uh, get, hooks up with Christian church. He feeds their hungry, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's an interesting man. Uh, but there is something inside of him, and he's ha- had bouts with cancer, all these different things. But when he can move, he moves. And when he can go, he goes. And he just does the work, whatever that is, and, and primarily uh, feeding people that need food. I love that about that guy. Praise the Lord. I was like, lay hands on me, bro. <laughs> Man, never quit, never give up. Uh, it's interesting to me, and it's really kind of a phenomenon, that people will work their whole life for a job. doesn't matter what the job is. They will retire, and in two weeks, they're dead. It's crazy. Why is that? Because they have no purpose. They have no reason to get up, and they've lost all of their purpose. And their heart stops. That's kind of spooky to me. I'm like, hey, before you retire, hey, let me get you something to do. Because we want you to stick around. We need your gifts. We need your talents. We need your purpose to repurpose. And there's plenty to do for the house of God. There's plenty to do for the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Even if you just went down to a corner downtown and told people about Jesus and passed out tracts. Repurpose your time. Serve in rest homes. Help somewhere. I always, I always feel good when I go to a hospital and there's a volunteer that's helping the hospital. I think that's pretty cool. It's like, hello, can you tell me where I am and where I should go? And they're like, no. Thank you. <laughs> is, is, is so-and-so here? Yeah. They look, no. Well, they told me they were here. They're not here. All right. Well, God bless you. <laughs> But they're there serving. They have a purpose. Amen? And so, so we, we want to have that inside of us. Not, and there's people that, that are 20-something years old that really think that they're here just for themselves. I've seen 80-year-old people that have more energy than some of the 20-year-olds. <laughs> Um, our singles group uh, used to be every single, you know, because we weren't uh, real big. So I did all the singles, and we'd have from 20 to, you know, 100 in, the, in our trips. We'd go on trips, and uh, uh, it was real funny. I think, I think uh, Sherry, you were with us that one time. Uh, but we had this elderly woman, and I had a, a milk crate I had so she could step into the van. And we were traveling around, traveling around. And, and you know, our people can cut up. They can really, really, uh, you know, run their mouths, our people. We, I just love them. Praise the Lord. You know, messing with Pastor Andy. Always messing with Pastor Andy. You know, why are we going here? What's going on? How long are we there yet? You know, the whole nine yards. And so at some point during the trip, this, this, this elderly lady, she said, I have never in all my born days heard so many people complain about so much. And she just went off on it. I was like, oh, I felt like I should leave the van, you know, while they get chewed out. <laughs> I was laughing so hard. But she, she was just, all she could see was, um, I'm so thankful <laughs> that Pastor Andy has taken the time, you know. And, and, uh, but she, you know, she just didn't understand our, our, uh, the way of humor our people are. You know, that's, that's how they have fun. They mess with you, you know. They mess with you. And uh, so, so, but I just thought it was interesting that she was never complaining, never said we're going too fast, never saying I want to rest, never, ever, n- never said a word, and, uh, and, uh, and, and pointed out what she was seeing. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. I thought, we're going to take you on all our trips. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Ephesians really quick here. Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I'm going to start with the New King James. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So literally, uh, God, who, who saved you, uh, not through your work, saved you through his work, he has created you for work. Seems interesting, doesn't it? So, so though you didn't work to get saved, you were created for work. And uh, it was all prearranged. So whatever you are, uh, God made you that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I know that we have some folks that could be possibly, um, maybe, uh, considered narcissists. Does anybody know what that is? A narcissist, typically, um, is somebody who totally lives for themselves. The whole universe revolves around you. Do you understand? And uh, um, typically, the knee jerk is that we think they are broken. They're messed up beyond recovery. They have no ability to think about other people. Do you understand? Now, now uh, there is obviously uh, different personalities, and there are people that are dominant, and there are people that are more passive, and there are people that are all in between. So, so um, I know that God doesn't mess people up and say, good luck. That's not what he does. Um, so if you are a dominant person, uh, it could be interpreted that you're a narcissist. Do you understand? Um, and so, so if you are a dominant person, then you need to understand that you have a service uh, to humanity, and it's probably uh, going to have some manifestation of leadership. The only thing is, is, is there are, are applications of that uh, where you have to um, probably dial that back, especially if you are a woman and your husband is supposed to be the head of your home. That would be an area where you have to dial it back and have perspective that I must honor and serve in leadership as he allows it to be. And so, so even uh, in a church, uh, God has his hand on people for leadership, uh, but, but whether male or female, uh, that it would have its submission to the pastor. Do you understand? And even if you don't understand why you can't do it the way you think you can or should, that ultimately for the blessing of the Lord to fall upon you, you're going to have to yield to that authority. And if you have no authority in your life, uh, if you are not serving, in other words, yielding, dying to yourself in some area, uh, then you could very well end up in some big trouble. Because uh, the most free place to be is in the service of the Lord and your life yielded to the authorities he's placed in your life. Pastor, husband, you, you know, police officer, you name it. You yield to that authority. And there is no clause for your personality in that arena. Do you understand? So I'm telling you that if you are a dominant or a person that is so strong... And people, uh, you know, are telling you you're bad because of it. That is not true. But yet you have to be mindful of who you are to function under the safety and yielded under the safety of God's authorities in order for you to walk in full blessing. Because if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you learn to be a servant of all. And again, the manifestation of service is different for each person in the sense that um, Pastor David, he is in a leadership role, and he has uh, been over my life uh, in that place and position for many years. And so uh, even though he's not present in the room, I have to function as though he is. 
Does that make sense? And ultimately, there is no pastor, even though he is called the head pastor, we are under shepherds of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter what your personality, you have to realize that you will give an account. So we are thankful for the safety of the word of God that will rescue us and raise us to a high place. Because he said, the prototype said, if you want to be great, or he who is great among you, let him be a servant of all. Praise the Lord. And so God has his hand on us. I'm not too big to bend over and pick up a piece of paper. I am not, there's nothing where I'm saying, ah, uh, that is beneath me. Now, I might recognize that somebody needs to do a better job at doing something and might have to work from my position to see if we can't get some folks to take care of that a little better. Do you understand? It's a leadership role. But I'm like, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, and then the weeds are a little overwhelming. You know, I'm like, oh, my, I look around, I'm like, oh, man, I can't take care of this in just one bend over. So, so I, I'll talk to our maintenance department, and, and those guys get after it. Praise the Lord. And I, I, I try to mention it to them. I try to say, oh, man, it looks so good. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But what are we talking about? Serving in our place. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is so good. So in the Amplified, this is a favorite. It says, uh, for we are God's own handiwork. This is Ephesians 2.10 in the Amplified Classic. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Praise God. So you're not just uh, accidentally walking through life. <laughs> You are purposefully placed here, purposefully gifted, purposefully anointed. And we have to discern uh, by the grace of God and listening to the Holy Spirit. For as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, right? They are the sons of God. And so we have to uh, have our, our, ourselves tuned in and aligned up with him so that we could know where it is we are to function. Uh, because sometimes we can get real comfortable doing nothing. But please understand, no one in this room is called to do nothing. You were created for a purpose, and you can ask God to open up your heart and reveal to you what that purpose is right now. What is it that you would have me to step into? Because it isn't the final purpose, uh, uh, but it may be how you get to where you need to go. And when Pastor David came out, there was only five of us in a home. And uh, uh, three of them actually, uh, or four of them left, four of them left. Three months. Church started three months in, and we've already last, lost a bunch of people. I'm it. Me, Pastor David, and Vicki are the original. And so, I mean, if, if I was like some people, like, man, this is going down fast. But... All the way from Jump Street till this day, I have said, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Amen. And oftentimes he says nothing. I take that as a yes. Because if he's going to change my trajectory, if he's going to change what I'm doing, he will tell me. That's my trust. And however simple my service is, wherever it is he, he has me serving, however simple, minute, or minuscule, or insignificant to others, matters not. What matters is I do whatever it is God has called me to do. And back in that day, it was everything. I received the offering, gave the offering. I, I, I you know, I, I'm bringing people up to the front, catching people as they fall under the power of God. I'm the usher, sound man. Uh, Pastor David had himself corded to a, a little boom box, you know, and we recorded tapes, you know, and those kind of things. I was doing all these different details. Oh, so many things. The only thing Pastor wouldn't let me do is lead worship. I don't know why. 
<coughs> I feel like I can sing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor Mark always tells a story about the lady who got up and, and said, the devil told me that I couldn't sing. And she began to sing, and, and Pastor Mark said, it was the first time the devil told the truth. <laughs> That's bad. Anyhow, <laughs> so they haven't let me sing. But anyways, <laughs> so wherever, <laughs> wherever God has you, <laughs> we're believing that he orders our steps. We're believing that he is able to speak to us and keep us right in the middle of whatever it is he would like us to do. But you uh, for sure need to ask yourself and actually respond to that voice. Is, it, is this what you would have me do, God? Is this what you want me to do? And it may very well be you're in the middle of it, but it might be that he may say, hey, I need you to do this. Because you're carrying a supply. And it needs to get to whoever that supply is for. And if we don't get there, if we don't do it, then the body suffers. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. It's all been arranged. Everybody say, it's all been arranged. All been Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 in the Amplified, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought as a personal debt to walk and conduct himself in the same way in which he walked and conducted himself. Now, this is the Amplified version of 1 John 2, 6. I'll read it again. Whoever says he abides in him ought as a personal debt to walk and conduct himself in the same way in which he walked and conducted himself. There are people that are... Uh, teaching a version of grace that uh, their version of grace doesn't allow the, this particular letter to be in the Bible. And so they have dismissed this letter of 1 John uh, because of its conflict with their doctrine. Uh, do, does anybody remember a scripture in the Bible that says, if you take away from? Exactly. That's not good. It says you will be cursed. It's crazy to start having to remove scriptures so it supports your doctrine. But listen, God's grace is a grace that causes us to be able to live the way he would have us to live. I, I call what they're talking about sloppe agape. No parameters, no consequences. They go as far to say, you know what? You don't even have to repent for your sins anymore. Is that crazy, you guys? Uh, it, it, the Bible says if, if we say we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that right? And so, so here, this is pretty strong. This is pretty bold. And we do thank God for his grace, his mercy. His mercies are new every day. Praise God. But his mercies are available to us to be able to live the way that he would have us to live. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And his grace is sufficient. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. But for the grace of God, I go. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to get anybody into condemnation today. I'm just saying what is being expected of us is to live our lives, walk our lives as Jesus did. And ultimately, I'm talking about being a servant to humanity, being a servant to all. Because that's where grace, greatness comes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, it talks about older women being an exam, example to the younger women. That men, we need to be an example to the young men. If we see young men acting this way or that way, then, then don't just go, look at that little boy. What's wrong with him? No, get involved. Say, hey, come here, young man. Praise the Lord. I can see that God's got his hand on your life. And usually a kid like I'll be like, uh, what? What? <laughs> just minister to him. Strengthen him. Help him. Glory to God. Don't just condemn. Be a servant. 
So here in the, the Message Bible in 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, If someone claims I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life Jesus lived. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God has such a great plan for us. And as I've been saying and will continue to say, is it's going to have its manifestation to people with skin on, serving our generation according to the will of God, which would include living as God would have us to live, a moral, chaste, righteous life, but serving. How can I help? Some of y'all don't realize that when you encourage me even after a message, it's encouraging. It literally is encouraging, and I appreciate it. And I know that I couldn't do any of this without the Holy Spirit's help and your prayers. So again, all the glory goes to God. And so thank you so much for being the people who you are. I believe that we have a great work that's just opening up. Things are getting ready to pop. And if we'll take this gospel to the world, tell them of his goodness. Man, it's so easy to pray with the people to get saved right now. Don't be silent. Take the gospel to the world. Grab a hold of somebody's hand and say, do you know God loves you and cares about you? Because the devil has told them that he's mad at them and doesn't like them. And that is a lie. He gave his son for them. But we have to tell them. We have to show him or show them what he looks like. And bring them into the house of God. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust forth laborers. Glory to God. And you are.